Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Houston Zoo. Uh, my name is Kenny. I'm one of our senior keepers in the training department. And we've got Denise over here as well. She's going to be helping us today with feeding a lot of our animals this morning. And uh, we're going to start off with our uh, archer fish in the front entrance exhibit of the Natural Encounter Building. So come on this way. So the archer fish are the animals that have the kind of bumblebee stripe coloration to them. Uh, they get the name archer fish due to the fact that they have a specialized groove in the roof of their mouth. And they actually will use that groove to shoot a jet of water at their food items. Uh, we can pretend as if this piece of shrimp is an insect on a tree limb. These guys will hopefully shoot a jet of water up at it and knock it into the water. Uh, some days they do a little bit more readily than others. We do this pretty regularly as a form of enrichment to give these guys a real natural uh, reaction to, uh, to their feeding behavior. So we've got shrimp and we've also got some crickets that we'll offer to these guys as well. So these guys do get live food very frequently. They also have a very uh, specialized mouth that kind of aims up towards the surface. That helps these guys uh, for uh, the, the, the form of that mouth is a, a benefit for these guys when it comes to feeding on surface animals and insects. There we go, there was a shot. And it seems to be a learned behavior. So these guys are not born with the ability to shoot accurately. Uh, once, they, once they learn how to shoot, they are usually dead on with that aim. There's a good few times where when I feed, we will uh, get splashed by these guys. Uh, their shot is incredibly uh, powerful. Again, it's enough, strong enough to knock an uh, insect off a tree limb. They have incredibly large eyes for their body size as well. That allows them to see and kind of get the trajectory right on how these guys uh, uh, can, can hit an insect on different height of limbs. So we're going to try a few crickets at this time. Hopefully they'll uh, show a little bit more interest with those guys. Our, uh, our school consists of seven archer fish. We have uh, a couple of different ages. We have some that are on the verge of about seven to eight years old. Those are the two largest individuals. We also have five that are uh, a much smaller. They're about four to, four to five years old. They all have the ability to, uh, to shoot. Some of them will do it more willingly than others. The biggest one is usually the one that's most likely to do it. Now the giraffe catfish decided to make an appearance to kind of Scare them off a little bit. So here we go. Let's see if we get one to shoot for us. If not, we can sprinkle some on the uh, on the wood and see if they go after them that way. Just like with us, some days they're more willing to be uh, uh, active. Some days they're a little chilled out, kind of like a nice Saturday afternoon, relaxing on the couch. They may not want to be uh, terribly energetic today. Paulina asks, what is the difference between males and females? That is a great question. 
and I honestly couldn't tell you. There's not a major difference in the way that they look. These guys breed uh, through like a, a broadcast, so they're not going to uh, retain them internally like a uh, like a seahorse would or anything like that. So it's going to be a little bit difficult to tell a male from a female. So I'm not even cer certain if we have. We may have all males. We may have some females. I'm not really certain what we have when it comes to our school. That's a good question. All right, so at this time, we're going to start making our way to the next exhibit. So we're going to head on to the, uh, the Stingray exhibit, and uh, then we'll, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see what he's up to, along with our electric eel and the four-eyed fish. So come on. So, with stingrays, this is a freshwater stingray, the Leopoldi or the white spotted river stingray. These guys are found in South America. A really neat thing about these guys is where they actually come from when it comes to their, uh, their kind of historical background. These animals, even though they live in rivers that feed into the Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea, they are actually more closely related to uh, stingrays found in the West Pacific Ocean, which is kind of funny to think because there's the big Andes mountain ridge on the west side of South America. Well, these stingrays and their ancestors made it into South America before those Andes formed. And if you were to go uh, on, on the internet and look up what a Pacific stingray looks like in comparison to this white spotted Leopoldi that's in front of us, you'll see that they have very similar spot type of patterns. Uh, they have little spines that go up and down the, the, the tail in addition to those extremely sharp spines. You can see those spines on this guy. They grow like fingernails. So this one actually has two spines near the end of his tail. They kind of curve up a little bit. The one that's on top will eventually fall off. The one that's underneath is growing in underneath it. And so the, every so often the new spine will grow underneath the old one and kind of pop it out. So they're constantly regenerating those spines as they, as they grow up and live. Now we talked about the form of the mouth on the archer fish kind of faced upward towards the surface to allow them to feed on the surface. I always kind of think it funny about the stingray is they actually don't really see what they're eating because their mouth is on the underside of their body. So it's pretty neat to see that these guys kind of are like a living Roomba or a living vacuum cleaner I like to think of because they'll just kind of cover over something and when they leave that spot, that food is no longer there. Uh, these guys also give birth to live young. So this is actually uh, an SSP animal. So this guy is uh, a species that's in our uh, uh, species uh, protection, uh, uh, species, uh, survival uh, program here at the Houston Zoo to uh, keep their numbers uh, in, in a good place. So we actually had, this is our male, our female is in the aquarium building. They've had quite a few offspring here at the Houston Zoo, and they have gone on to other different institutions. So it's kind of neat to see uh, this guy as well, serving a very important purpose here in, the, uh, here in the Houston Zoo. Those kind of white spots will help camouflage this guy. He'll normally hide out underneath a lot of substrate. Which, which would be like little gravel and small bits of sand and stuff like that. So you can see there's a lot of that in the exhibit. So he'll, he'll hide amongst that pretty regularly. And if you look on his underside, which you're not gonna probably see much of, the underside is kind of a white color, which would allow him to camouflage if he were ever off of the bottom of the water. So if these guys were uh, off the bottom, you would see a white belly and you see a dark top, which helps them camouflage in with sand and fallen tree limbs and, uh, and leaves and stuff like that. Noah asked a good question is what is he eating today? I forgot to mention that he's eating some shrimp today. He absolutely loves shrimp and he got that for lunch today. And we'll head on to the next animal. We've got our electric eel over here. 
Now these guys have a very peculiar body style. So they look like a big tube. And if you can see these tiny little fins right up near its head, about three to six inches behind that is where its body cavity, so like its stomach, its intestines, and all of that kind of end there. And when you start to see that kind of ribbon fin that goes all the way to the tip of its body, that is actually all specialized muscle to essentially conduct that electricity because this is, again, an electric eel. They will send out a small charge pretty regularly and a means to kind of hunt and almost like sonar in a way to find their food items that could be hiding in small caves, underneath trees, whatever the case may be. Wherever food might be hiding, they can use that sonar to try and find it. So they don't really find their food based off of vision. It's more based off of smell and uh, their ability to find them with that electrical current. If you look at their body close enough, which you probably won't be able to see uh, as well uh, unless you're really right up on the animal, but the, the body actually is kind of wavy looking. If you've ever looked at an air conditioning condenser that's outside of a, a house or outside of a building where uh, the, it turns on and runs, uh, it has a whole bunch of little tiny ridges all over it. That's to try and help maximize the heat let off uh, and to cool down your house faster. Well, this guy has a lot of ridges on his body to try and maximize the surface area for his electrical current. So it's kind of funny that this guy isn't smooth at all. He's very much uh, wrinkled and, and covered in those wrinkles to maximize his ability to send a shock. Uh, we had a question from Daniel is, what are their predators? Luckily, there's not a whole lot of these guys. Uh, there's, they're pretty solitary animals. The likelihood of them being attacked by much anything is pretty unlikely. Um, so that's a good thing. These guys are pretty far, uh, pretty far up the food chain because you wouldn't really want to touch these guys. That's usually how they send off their charge. So if something were to make contact with them, that's when they can send off the strongest of their charge. And so these guys being cave dwelling animals, they will hide their entire body in a cave more times than not. And our electric eel here will like to use his, uh, his the, all the wood and he tends to move that around a good bit. So you may sw see him swim through the wood pretty regularly if you see him on exhibit when you're here at the zoo. So he doesn't leave, he, he's pretty stationary more times than not. Now I tend to get the question pretty often is, well, what are those smaller fish in there? Those guys are simply as tank mates they are not food for him. They are, uh, again, because he's so stationary, it's, it's easy to, to not see our, our electric eel buddy here. So we try to, seeing those smaller fish in here help get their, uh, help, help, help get, draw attention to, the, uh, to this guy. Rachel asks, how can you save them in the wild? Great question. So with most of these animals living on our river or living in freshwater uh, riverways, if we can reduce plastics and, and limit the amount of waste that makes it into waterways, especially around here in our bayous, it'll help cut back on uh, any potential blockages from waste blocking our bayous. Uh, for these guys, waste and stuff like that that finds their way into the river uh, can also create negative issues. It, it could also lead to uh, different products getting into the cyst, into the water, and uh, negatively affecting the animals. Uh, health. So that's also something to very much keep in mind when it comes to throwing away trash, try to reduce, reuse, and recycle whenever, whenever possible. So in general, recycling is a very great place to start when it comes to protecting all of our animals that live in the wild, especially aquatic animals. And this guy has a little tiny uh, pitting all over his face to help allow him to uh, sense where food is as well so he can kind of feel it uh, based off of those vibrations. Um, the, uh, the stingray, I forgot to mention, there's a very good trivia word that I want to bring up to everybody. So uh, stingrays and sharks have a sensory electroreceptor called the ampullae of Lorenzini. That's a nice trivia phrase that you'll probably never use but uh, something that stuck with me when I was in school. Uh, and those are like little jelly-filled pits that are around the muzzle, around the mouth, the eyes of uh, stingrays and sharks to allow them to 
sense motion and electrical currents of animals' heartbeats and stuff like that. Just absolutely fascinating stuff. And you can, you can see uh, our, our electric eel also has to go up to the surface to breathe. That is one thing that also may surprise you is these guys are obligate air breathers. These guys will actually not be able to breathe underwater. So our electric eel goes up to the surface every few seconds or so to, uh, to make sure that he can, fill, he can kind of gas off the air and then breathe in another uh, big lungful. So he's very interesting how this guy can and breathe like that. He also can get a little bit through absorption from the water. But Patty asked also a good question, has, have I ever touched it? Uh, that's actually a great question. If we ever have to physically work on this exhibit, which I do pretty regularly, we do have electrician's uh, gloves that are graded for high electricity. Uh, I still try to make a point of not putting my hands in the water and we use uh, non-metal equipment, so like uh, plastic rods, uh, rubber nets, stuff that isn't metal to try and limit the amount of obvious conduction in the water. So I have actually interacted with him, but in general, we, we try to limit that uh, whenever possible just for, for safety's sake, but we do have a lot of safety measures uh, involved. Uh, when it comes to working with this exhibit to make sure that everyone is safe at all times. But in general, our hands don't even go into the water. We use tools that do all the work for us. But great question. How big can they get, I, I was asked. So that's another good question. This guy is about three to three and a half feet, maybe, maybe about three feet, I guess, in length. Uh, they can probably get upwards of about five feet give or take, maybe six at the absolute most. Uh, I'm willing to bet it's probably closer to the five foot range. And the kind of rough estimate that we've always kind of gone with when it comes to the uh, strength of their electrical current is that for every foot, you can possibly estimate that to 100 volts of electrical current. So this guy being a little roughly three feet, give or take, so maybe 300 or so volts. Uh, and that would be probably a full charge type of thing. But again, it's not really easy to, to know for certain how strong these guys can send off a charge. This is kind of a, a rough estimate that has been tossed around about these guys. AJ asks, how old is it? This guy's probably about four years old, give or take. Maybe as much as five. Um, and he's still a growing, growing boy or girl. Uh, Connor asks, what are they related to? Uh, this guy is actually related to knife fish. So he is uh, not a true eel in a sense that he's not like a moray eel that have the, uh, the, 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 the sharp teeth, the skinny mouths, the, the, the teeth in the back of their mouth, the pharyngeal teeth. These guys are more uh, considered like a knife fish over a true eel great questions y'all keep them coming i do want to uh reintroduce ourselves uh myself i'm kenny i'm kenny i'm one of our senior keepers in the aquarium department we're here looking at some of our more unusual and eccentric fish here in the natural encounters building and uh my co-worker denise is upstairs she's been feeding these guys for us today and i want to welcome everybody again to uh to another facebook live video here at the houston zoo we're going to head on over to our next set of fish which I mean I love all these guys but these are one of my favorites the four-eyed fish also known as the anableps uh, they're gonna be the surface dwelling fish these guys uh, tend to feed on mud banks where they will find insects these guys I get a lot of questions of well, are those like a mud skipper or what type of animal is that? It's kind of crazy, it's on the surface. Is it normal like that? And it is, these guys do live on the surface like they are right now. The middle of their back and their eyes will stay out of the water. You'll see them kind of do the worm dance every few seconds to keep their eyes wet and also, re, uh, and also uh, keep their back wet as well. So it's very cool how these guys behave. 
they, unlike some of the other fish, like the archer fish, these guys are very easy to tell a male from a female. Uh, the males actually have a, uh, a specialized fin, and the females will not have that specialized fin. The, the males will actually fertilize eggs internally of the female. That's what we consider ovoviviparous. So the female will hold eggs internally instead of laying an egg nest like a lot of fish will. The female will hold those eggs, the male will fertilize them. Once those babies hatch, so they're actually fed via yolk, which is extremely fascinating. The female will then give birth to those live babies, but again, those babies were born from an egg, not, not, not natural like, uh, like you would see in mammals. So it's extremely fascinating when it comes to the birthing process of a four-eyed fish. Since I've been here, we've had in the ballpark of 100 to maybe 120 babies born here at the Houston Zoo, and we just fed them a whole bunch of crickets. So hopefully our four-eyed fish will uh, get interested in it this morning. Once they realize they're there, they'll go after them for sure. But they've got, we got a whole bunch of crickets in here for the four-eyed fish to kind of go to town on. Because they feed on surface, insects and mud banks and whatnot they actually have a specialized mouth it's kind of like a shovel in a way so it allows them to kind of dig into the dirt and the and the uh, uh, clay banks of rivers and because of that their digestive system is extremely inefficient so these guys seem to eat quite a lot and even though they do eat quite a lot only a little bit of it goes to their nutrition these guys eat, they have a very high metabolism, they'll eat constantly. And once the babies are born, they're about an inch in length. And within about three days, they, the babies will have used up their yolk sac and they will start eating the same type of food that the parents eat. Very cool stuff. And because of the fact these guys live on the surface, most fish, the gill cover, the, what we call the operculum, is usually right up around the side of their, uh, their heads. But these guys, they act, the, uh, that gill cover is actually almost underneath their eyes, allowing their, heads, or their gills to stay underwater at all times, even though they're right at the surface. All right, well, I do want to thank you all so very much for joining us today. It has been my pleasure to to show you guys some very cool animals here at the Houston Zoo. I want to make sure I bring up uh, the fact that because we, we do miss you guys so much, we look forward to having you all here, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, we do have an emergency relief fund for all the care of the animals here at the Houston Zoo. Feel free to stick a, a, to take a look at the HoustonZoo.org website, learn a little bit more about the emergency relief fund, and also uh, look forward to joining us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, for the next Facebook Live. It's been my pleasure again, myself, Kenny, and Denise. Thank you all so much for, jo uh, for joining us today, and have a great day.